All right, welcome to today's broadcast. We're going to be doing uh, a session on data today around your EHS programs. Um, you should all be able to see our slides. We're going to kick things off. Sorry for the couple minute delay. We had a couple technical difficulties in getting these set up for you. Um, but today we're going to be talking about how to use data to really improve compliance and, and really ultimately prevent risk and have more efficient operations, both from an operations production side, but also uh, the EHS side. So today it's myself and Courtney um, as the speakers on here. Um, Courtney is one of our senior sales engineers. I'm Ryan Janik. I'm one of the co-founders of Mapistry here. Courtney, if you can advance us. Yeah. And a yeah. Couple, of, couple of things on the agenda uh, that we wanted to talk about was just really the cost and cause of non-compliance and look at some of the financial impacts because ultimately all this data that we're going to be collecting today or talking about today that you would collect in your program really goes to looking at reducing the cost of compliance or the cost of non-compliance and those can come in a bunch of different areas sometimes it's like penalties lawsuits sometimes it's just operational costs of non-compliance so we're going to be spending a little bit of time around that and then we're going to be spending some time on just how do you improve compliance in general how do you use different data capture methods talk about some of the history behind that um, and look at best practices for improving compliance and preventing risk. And then a big part of this, especially, you know, we're a software company, we love our digital tools, but if you're using any kind of digital tools or you're making changes to a program, a big part of that is how do you get buy-in and how do you get financial support for some of these programs? So we're gonna talk about building the business case for better data capture, um, collection, the tools you can use. So talk through some of the possible business cases that you can have for that. And then if you want to stick around uh, at the very end, Courtney's going to walk through a quick demo on some of the, uh, the Mapistry platform data collection tools. As many of you know, we're a, a compliance platform for EEH&S uh, where we take all these different data sources and put it into one platform uh, so that you can collect data in any, really any way the way you operate and then be able to analyze it, make decisions. Um, today, we're going to be talking more generally around data collection, the costs, the business case. But if you want to stick around and see a little bit of a preview of a Mapistry demo, um, you'll have that opportunity at the very end. So with that, let's jump over to some of the problems. So when we look at problems, you know, and this is kind of setting the stage for the cost of non-compliance. One is non-compliance can be very costly and that can come in, that cost can come in a, a bunch of different ways. It could be lawsuits and fines. You know, you can get multi-million dollar lawsuits, fines, regulatory penalties. Um, it can also be costly, uh, as you've seen a lot with like ESG or, or sustainability reporting. There's a lot of pressure for companies, whether you're a public sector or even kind of downstream in the supply chain or on the private side, um, to root, you know, shareholders, stakeholders, that could be your customers, that could be investors, uh, are putting a lot more pressure around sustainability and environmental compliance. And the costs show up either in less work um, you know, winning less work because you're not able to meet certain sustainability criteria, or even just the cost of capital. Um, there's a fair amount on the investment front where investors are really looking or requiring certain environmental um, and sustainability measures be in place um, to really access that capital. So that can be really costly on that. Um, the other big factor, and this is going to be the a big part of what we're talking about, is how siloed data is today. Uh, where you've got EHS teams at maybe a site level, very um, separated from a regional or a, a corporate level from their data sources. You know, you may have sites that have the data just sitting there in a three ring binder, but if you don't have access to that, that can be really problematic. And, we're, and a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how you, how do you move from that kind of reactive, gotta go run out to site, grab data to make decisions to a more proactive approach. And the third part of the problem is really, as many of you on, on this webinar are, are probably experiencing, is resources are pretty limited. You're fighting for budget, you're fighting for headcount, you're getting stretched in more directions. The regs are only getting more complex. You've got only a fixed amount of time in your day to, to be able to address them. And in some cases, you just you know have more sites to cover or you 
you know, have an opening, you know, everyone's talking about hiring and workforce, like you just may have open gaps on your team that it means that compliance is maybe not getting filled to the level that it needs to be. So really non-compliance is costly. That's one of the biggest problems, but number two is the data that we use for EHS is very siloed. And then there's the resource issue of you're being asked to do more, you have less people, um, you, you have limited bandwidth to actually address it. So with that, uh, we wanna break it down and really talk about the costs of non-compliance. So we look at the problem, it's costly, it's siloed, it's resources are limited, but let's look at what the, some of those costs might be. And if we look on the costly side, it could be, could be the fines and lawsuits. Um, those are really, you know, bottom line impact. It could be brand damage. You know, we've seen more and more, and I don't know if any of the folks on this call have experienced it with um, your customers, or maybe for if you're an EHS professional leader, you're getting your like sales and marketing team come to you and say, uh, I, I'm doing a RFP. I need to show our environmental program. I need to show how many violations we've gotten in the past. I need to show our sustainability program. Uh, and it's, Sales marketing wants it because they want to win work. Uh, there also can be a brand damage. You know, people move away from uh, vendors and, and suppliers if there are perceived issues or if it doesn't fit with their brand. Um, and that could be consumer brands, but it also could be, say, a transportation company that's, you know, it's a municipal contract and the community is really upset because there's a perception of like um, dumping stuff down storm drains from washing vehicles or you know fuel spills those different things so that, that brand damage can show up in a bunch of different areas and then there's the employee relationship and some of the studies out there and this really ties to that like workforce hiring at the end of the day companies are built around the products and the people and if you damage those relationships or you're not able to hire as competitively because there's a negative perception related to environmental or sustainability um, that can be really problematic for a company we see that more and more uh, as a key criteria for people in their jobs and in their employers around sustainability and environmental so it can be a, a huge benefit uh, in terms of like recruiting and pulling people in, which can help fill some of those labor shortages, but also can hurt as people want to leave and go to more um, sustainable or environmentally conscious companies. So you can get that degradation in the employee relationship too. Uh, and then the final piece is just, you know, facility shutdown or, you know, not being able to construct a facility because you're not able to get certain permits or regulators have a neg negative perception of your operations and they, make it harder for you to operate. So facility closure or just slowdowns on work uh, is another thing, or, or maybe you're bumping up against your air permit limits and you don't really understand how to address that, uh, which will slow what you can take on from a production standpoint. So a bunch of different ways that can really impact your organization and its bottom line. If we loop back, and this is the thing all, a lot of people really think about is like the penalty cost. How much is, if I get inspected and I get a fine, you know, what's it gonna cost me? And these honestly are some jaw dropping numbers in terms of like the air at $109,000 a day under the Clean Air Act, all the way down at the quote unquote low end of 37,500 on SPCC violations. If you're involved in, in any kinds of penalties, lawsuits, typically those kind of lawsuits, penalties, it's not just the money you're paying out, it's also your internal spend on um, attorneys, consultants, and then just all the time, because as soon as you get into something like this, you're pulling in even more executives, more, more folks, and that has a huge, huge cost that's not really shown on these dollars. So this is a helpful slide, and as we go back to like talking about building the business case and all, this is probably the number one slide that people will, will, will steal from and pull from in terms of building their business case. Um, and then the next slide has the some of the examples. This is probably the number two slide of people pulling like building the business case from like how do we mitigate risk? Here are some of the numbers. Um, there's a lot in terms of like high dollar violations around compliance. So making the case for what is non-compliance cost, what's the potential for our company um, to really have to deal with this. Um, so we, we talked a little bit high level, like some of the problems, some of the costs of non-compliance. Now we're gonna go into like some of the potential causes of non-compliance. Uh, and this is gonna be 
where a lot of you probably as EHS leaders, EHS professionals, operations folks really um, face a lot of the challenges uh, in terms of like a day to day. So one is just time. We talked about like resource constraints, just how do you find the time and for your teams, how do you find, enable them where their entire day isn't spent on data entry, like taking lab reports, taking production information, paper sheets, like manually entering data is just an incredible amount of time that you've got a whole EHS team doing. And we hear it time and time again, you know, 50% of the day is spent on like data entry. And that's absolutely absurd because it's a complete waste of like your all's time on it. So that's number one. Number two is like that data silos, just not having visibility. Uh, the number of times people as uh, like an area environmental manager just don't have visibility into what's happening on a site until they go out there. They've got to build that in as like, I've got to go to every site once a month, once a year to collect that data. So not visibility rather than I want to go to the site to go work with them, problem solve, teach. It's really just grabbing some of the data from the site to make sure that you're meeting all your compliance obligations. Um, number three is just, we talked about this at the beginning, like the regulatory environment ratcheting up with air and water permits, just constantly getting stricter. Um, there's just more requirements around like flow meter, P pH data capture, inspection requirements, uh, the different permit limits, how many times you have to sample. It has not gotten any easier, so that continues. Third party groups, regulatory, um, this has always been a threat. It's always been going up. We'll show some stats on the next slide in a minute but it continues to, to increase. The other factor, and we'll, we'll do a webinar on this, but there's um, EPA comes out with their national compliance initiatives. Uh, we're gonna be, they're gonna be released in June. We'll do a webinar on some of those. It's just another thing to keep a track of is like if you fall into an industry that's targeted or category of like program area, like if you're really um, focused on like wastewater discharge or process water. If that's in that compliance initiative, that'll only increase and it's just another further accelerant. And then the fifth issue that we often see and what we're going to talk about, Courtney's going to talk about is like, you have so many different tools out there. You're probably using everything from like different software systems, using Outlook reminders, running stuff in Excel, paper forms, like that can be overwhelming in terms of the number of different things that come together to form a program. Um, so these are the top five issues that we see today. Uh, I'm curious if other people, you know, have other issues that they're they're kind of facing. I would say maybe creeping on here is just the hiring workforce, you know, that resource limits is if we see that more and more, I think as of late and number six, maybe that workforce is the number of people that say, do, do you know an EHS manager in X region? Because I really need to fill a bunch of holes on the team. Um, that's, that comes up more and more frequently. These are the ones I've heard consistently over the past couple of years, but workforce has, has been one that's creeped up a lot lately. Um, I'm not necessarily excited about people struggling to hire, but I'm excited about the potential for software to fill some of those gaps, uh, especially if we can like, automate some of the data collection? Does it free up your existing teams and yourselves to just be able to do different things within your role? So with that, let's jump over to some of the numbers. I thought everybody on the call, this is, whenever we put together data on like violations and costs, everyone takes the slide and goes back and says, this is why I need more budget this year is because the penalty cost just is going up to the right. You know, the trend line for number of penalties is going up. Um, this is a really good stat. We'll send out uh, some of the, we'll send out a recording of this, but also the slides that you can use if you want to use these kind of stats. Um, but as you can see, the trends, uh, both for the number of penalties and the penalty cost um, has been increasing significantly, you know, year over year as we look over the past like 15, 20 years. And then, that all brings us to this kind of discussion. And this is really, the rest was laying the groundwork for why we're here today and why you probably signed up for this webinar is, the question is, is your approach today reactive or proactive? And then where do you want to go? And Courtney and I today are gonna to really center our discussions around data in your EHS program around a reactive approach versus a proactive approach. Because when you're in that reactive and 
we've all felt it at varying times, but are you just running around, putting out fires, um, you know, being told that compliance program is just a cost center, uh, you know, you've got the two lists is just getting massively piled. Is that a very reactive approach? And that's overwhelming because you're dealing with just the amount of work, the pressure, the, you know, the potential penalties. Or are you in an environment where you can be uh, in a proactive environment where you can do some data analysis from your office? You don't have to go out, collect it manually. Um, are you able to provide to leadership within 60 seconds a snapshot of are we in compliance with our permit obligations? Um, you know, are we able to identify EHS goals and then track their, their progress over the year? And that's what we want to get to is that proactive environment where we can leverage EHS from a revenue profitability standpoint, especially as ESG and sustainable sustainability become more important. Um, but also hiring, you know, being able to tout the measures that you're, you all are doing. Uh, and then just as I think every EHS professional environmental person out there is an environmentalist at heart. They love what they're doing. I think the people in this industry love going hiking, fishing, hunting, all of that. So there's a deep appreciation. So just personal wins of actually protecting the environment and being able to have the data to back that up. That's the future we want to go to with this proactive compliance. So the, what we want to talk about is how do we use data to do that? How do we move towards a proactive approach um, using data. And one is just simplifying data capture. How do we just get the raw data into one place from all the various things that you're juggling so that you can actually make those decisions, be a better business partner internally to leadership. Um, and then number two, once the data's in, how do you analyze that? Where's the potential um, deficiency areas or can you foresee uh, where where you might stumble, you know, and if we can look out ahead and then just have that like culture of EHS excellence uh, because it's it's fun when you get to that where you have the data, you're starting to analyze it, then you're creating a culture and a team that no matter who you add or who you bring on, whether it's an EHS team or the operations team, uh, it's just part of the culture. It's part of that expectation. So that's where we want to go. What that results in, like as an EHS leader, you're preventing um, fines, violations, you're preventing shutdowns, um, you're mitigating and solving EHS problems before they get to that level. Um, you're able to be out in front of those problem areas. Um, so uh, Ryan just kind of laid out for us what the cause of the problems are and the cost. And I'm going to jump in now and look at the data as the source of the problem. What can go wrong and what can we do differently with data? So some of the data collection problems we hear about um, are that, again, paper records aren't accessible. So that problem of being siloed, um, that there's a bunch of effort to get data into a central place, whether you're scanning forms in, doing a manual data entry, and this is taking a lot of time. Uh, we also hear from customers that were struggling with, with missing data, that data was not getting um, logged properly or excuses like, well, the forms were lost in the trucks. Um, and similarly, uh, just information taking a lot of time to get to them. We have customers who had consultants mailing them paper documents before uh, joining Mapistry. Um, and then that manual data entry. So if you're relying on somebody to collect data in the field on paper and then come in and type it in, there's the opportunity for transcription errors. And finally, like Ryan was alluding to with this reactive versus proactive approach, there's a huge opportunity cost here for EHS professionals. If they don't have time to focus on solving the bigger problems at their sites because so much time is spent managing this data. Uh, and when we're talking about data, we want to remember that we're not just talking about that quantitative data. You know, I think people hear data and they think, uh, my lab reports, my emissions reports, but we're also talking about all that qualitative data that's required in your permits, whether that's your inspections and observations, uh, needing to follow up on your corrective actions, as well as just taking photos and having maps of your facilities. So we want to think of data both as the qualitative and quantitative information that needs to be kept and available um, to be in compliance with your permits. 
And at the end of the day, this is a lot to keep track of. There's weekly, daily, monthly inspections, quarterly reports, annual reports, and again, all of that qualitative and quantitative data flowing through your facilities. Um, traditional methods of data capture, sometimes, you know, I, my desk definitely looked like this in my early career, lots of stacks of paper. Um, maybe you're stepping from paper to Word or Excel. You've got people scanning files in, getting PDF copies, or maybe you're trying some um, do-it-yourself app apps for collecting data and then maybe you've gone so far as to install sensors and you've got some data um, that you need to go out and capture from those sensors so digitizing forms this is often a first place people will start when trying to get that central data approach there's a lot of options out there on the market you can do it for free with google forms they let you customize your forms and it'll feed in to um, a spreadsheet for you. And again, there's a number of um, available options if you wanna start going mobile and collecting information in a digital format. Kind of on the opposite end of that, you might hear your IT team talking about using an API. And this, it really sounds like a holy grail. It is a great tool. The API is this application programming interface. This is where IT can hook your data sources up to multiple locations so that you're only um, and you're not doing a manual data transfer so the data is coming in and getting shared to all the appropriate locations this eliminates the need to upload data to multiple locations um, and so what what are companies doing today well over on the right with their um, you know their purchasing data their utility data uh, hr accounting that's all being handled in a comprehensive digital solution usually, and leadership has access to that information when they need it. Um, on the other side, we've got what's happening um, with most EHS programs, which is you've got lots of information being collected across lots of facilities, uh, different reports that you have to send out to the regulators, different requests from leadership, and the challenge is it's all still flowing through a person and so there's somebody out there who's gathering all of these disconnected sources and pulling it together and trying to create these reports we hear about people spending you know a month at the end of the year just to handle their um, air permitting or they're doing you know a couple days every every week or every month to stay on top of all of this data when the other um, parts of your company are just letting that data that data flow um, so comparing some of these data management solutions, again, we've got, um, you know, the physical paper, the storage, the pro there is, you don't need to really change what you're doing, don't need to train anybody. The con is you're living in that reactive uh, world where you're needing to, uh, you know, call people and trace, track down those documents uh, if a problem gets brought to your attention. Um, the step up from that is your, like, Microsoft Office. And Excel. Excel is a great tool for calculating and visualizing data. The problem is it isn't built for your EHS use case, and so that data input and output can feel very clunky. Uh, stepping up from there is Google or a cloud-based system. These are collaborative tools, so you've got access to the information. Um, the cons are it can only handle limited amounts of um, data, and there's still a lot of manual effort needed to go find what you're looking for. Uh, and then finally is an EHS software system. And this, if done properly, will be a single system with complete visibility through your entire program. Uh, the cons there, the initial implementation phase can be um, a bit time consuming to get set up and running, but after that, you've got everything, you're saving a lot of time on the back end. Pass it um, back over to Ryan, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about that centralized, creating a centralized approach. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Yeah, you're right. Like, there is some time on the setup. I mean, process change, business change is always tough. Like as you're going from, this is the way we've always done it. It's quote unquote easy to do it that way um, because there's no change, but all of us struggle with change in, to some extent. And I think a lot of people on this call and, and others, especially if you're in a, a leadership position of any kind within your organization or really want to innovate, you're going to have to overcome that that hurdle of of change um, because you're so excited about like 
creating efficiencies, creating visibility, creating order. Um, because right now, like as Courtney showed that my desk was the same way early in my career of just like, here's my file cabinets, here's all my folders, I've got binders everywhere for every project I'm running. Um, but how do we create order out of that chaos and like spend the time analyzing the data and you know all of our skill sets in science and engineering and business analytics? How do we use all of those to really add value to the organization? So what I'm going to be talking about is you know how do we use a dedicated EHS platform? As Courtney showed you uh, on your screen on the right hand side, it looked great. You know just Systems integrated, the IT team's got it all set up. It flows up, you know, the dashboards at the very top, probably using Power BI or Tableau for leadership. And then on the left is EHS, and it's just everything is people in between every step of the process. So one of the things is by going with an EHS platform and really tying it together, you're gonna get some of those benefits that you're seeing in the streamlined simplicity of automatic data capture, consistent data capture. And then from there, once you got the data, the cool part, this is where like the, the value add is EHS folks is you can start setting up calculations and visualizations and filtering through that data and, and asking questions of which business unit is underperforming on SPCC inspections. Is that a, a teaching moment for us as an organization? That doesn't happen if you're spending all your time collecting the data. So one of the reasons to, to implement like a single EHS system um, and collect all the data, and it's not just a system of checkboxes as we'll talk about, but like a true vertically integrated system with integrations and all, is you get it all in one place so you can do those cool parts of the job, the calculations, the visualizations, the, the coaching, the teaching, the problem solving. Um, and then being able to share, not just within an EHS team or a site team, but also up with leadership of like, this is the scope of what EHS covers. We cover 15,000 inspection points. We collect, you know, 20 different water samples, all of which can cost the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like this is this is what we do as a program. So you can show that value and share those with others within the organization. So what does a digital solution actually look like? Um, it can, if, if you want to go on and let's dive into the the type of business data we might collect, it could be production data. So if you're a ready mix uh, concrete supplier, you've got all sorts of production data you're running on throughput. It could be aggregates, it could be the output, you know, uh, going off tickets. Uh, you can capture that and pull that in. Um, could be your waste data. It could be we shipped off X amount of pounds of class two has waste. Uh, or it could be fuel consumption or equipment run times. All these kind of business data are very valuable and uh, critical for the EHS team. And what you want in a digital solution is you want to match and get that data any way you can. The word, you know, the most time consumed is manually log it. If that's the only way you can capture it, that's fine. Um, you want to be able to put it into a digital solution that way rather than letting it just sit on a clipboard, a piece of paper hanging next to like a paint booth. Um, you want to at least capture it digitally that an operator every day gets a reminder, can click in and say, I used six gallons of this. And then I'll, and and then what happens as you flow through to that EHS software bucket, those calculations on like your emission factor times the usage is going to give you a VOC output number. And then you can report on it, analyze it, do all the alerts. So you want to think about what are the data sources you want to capture, how we're going to get them in, like manually log it, or even better is we can take uh, lab data, come in, uh, in an email and get it as a CSV from the lab and just drag and drop. And Courtney will show you how to do that, I think, uh, at the end. But you can just drag and drop into a platform and then all that data just gets automatically pushed through. And you can see from a record keeping perspective, from an analytics, from even an alerting against your permit limits. Um, and that just frees up a lot of time. So this is this is the, the vision and part of our mission as a company is to make what you're seeing here happen for all of you um, because it reduces the amount of time and gives you more visibility on that right-hand side with reporting analytics alerts. So we want to make this a very streamless um, or a very uh, streamlined and seamless process for you all. 
So how do we do it? So we're going to break it down. So data capture, um, that can be done on a mobile app. It could do your inspection forms, as Courtney said. Uh, it could be tasks. It could be, you know, your bag house inspections and looking at like pressure differentials. All of that can be captured in a mobile app, pushing it through. Uh, and then the, the sample upload, we could um, capture data just from CSV files. It could just be Maybe you don't have the ability to use the API and directly integrate in with like command command batch if you're a ready mix provider or um, if you're using like ignition and looking at like your run times, all these other systems that you use on the business side. Maybe we can't integrate in, but we can download a CSV file from them and drag and drop and upload. And that way we're not manually logging that data. So data capture will happen in a bunch of different ways. And one of the things you all get a copy of our ebook on this where we go into more detail on like the different ways to capture data and the pros and cons of them. Um, but data capture is really gonna happen in a bunch of different ways. You really want a, a platform that can capture it in any of these different ways. You don't wanna just limit yourself to one of these because I think uh, not every company is only capturing data in one way. You're gonna to have to react to like how the sites are capturing data today. And then maybe a couple of things are coming in via an integration and other things are coming, you're just gonna upload the file yourself. So you wanna have that flexibility built into it from a data capture standpoint. Once you capture the data, step two is, or, or how it works in terms of stage two is we capture the data. Now, how do we communicate it out? Um, and that could be reminders to capture the data, like, hey, you didn't enter something. There's a missing value here, like a, a single system checks that and tells you that. It could be tasks of, I did all my inspections, but I've got all these follow-up items to make sure I'm capturing all my regulatory data. You know, maybe I um, did a safety inspection and my, my uh, my guarding is missing. Well, if I capture that digitally, uh, now the system can communicate that out automatically. It can send an email with the photo saying, uh, machine guarding around all of these open areas, we need this covered. Um, so a system not only captures data, but it's gonna communicate it out and you want it to do it as automatically as possible. So you don't wanna do an inspection, even on a mobile app, and then have to go create follow-up items in some other system or some other way. You want it to just happen as part of the inspection process. So if I'm walking around uh, a site and I see a problem, I can go through my inspection check by uh, checklist. But if I have a problem as part of that workflow, I should just be able to create a corrective action or a task right there in my workflow. And it just go out seamlessly to the person that I assign it to. I, I don't want to like actually have to go to another piece of another system to create tasks or follow up items, or I don't want to have to do it in a Google form and then for the inspection, then go over to my email system and attach the PDF and send an email. Like that's just too many, too many steps. And what you want in a digital system is that to flow seamlessly. So we captured the data, we communicated it out. Number three is you want to think about like, how do we analyze that? How do we look at percent complete versus not complete for whether it be inspections or even just data logging, like that paint booth example. One of the things you want to think about in a platform is how do I analyze and maybe look at different categories or how do I find deficiencies or gaps? Because ultimately you're identifying risk and, and driving accountability through the organization. The other pieces like exceedances, if you're pulling all your lab data in, you're streaming in like your equipment run times, what if I exceed a permit limit for my like run times or my VOC emissions or even just like TSS in a, in a single system, that's all gonna happen automatically and send out alerts and you'll be able to visualize it. Whereas you're not opening up an, e an email opening the PDF, pulling up your permit, comparing the two uh, every time or taking the TSS readings from three different sample points across 10 locations, entering them in a spreadsheet to see which ones are exceeding, which are getting close, those type of things. You want that to happen as seamlessly as possible in a single system. Um, so those are the kind of steps of like, how do we centralize? How do we create some order and efficiencies out of what can be very chaotic from an EHS program perspective of like, different competing requirements and just different ways of operating. So yeah, Ryan just shared with us what we want to look for in a centralized approach. So if you're 
um, you know, starting to think about how to take your EHS program digital or how to improve on what you're doing, we're going to walk through the steps, key steps to success. Um, so we like to say you want to walk before you run. So we're going to take um, a, a measured approach to this. The first step is um, you preparing. So to prepare, first thing you want to do is identify uh, potential data sources. And the way you're going to do this is you're going to want to reach out to um, the facilities and find out what pieces of data are they capturing. Uh, we see one of the biggest indicators of success at transforming your program is coming in prepared and ready to digitize those forms. And this, like I said, you want to reach out, make sure um, you know you know if some facility is subject to a strange um, local requirement that they have to measure, you know, pH daily or something that maybe you you as a um, central or regional manager is not familiar with, but they may have very specific uh, local requirements. So survey the locations that want to that are going to go digital and find out what they're doing and what information they need to track. You want to agree on an approach. So get everybody on board with um, what the objectives are of going digital and then discuss do we want um, internal tools do we want to shop for external tools what capabilities are we looking for and then what's the time to value how fast can we get this up and running and what bandwidth do we have does somebody have the time to um, work through this digital transformation process and then finally in that preparing stage is you want to set the bar for quality data capture. You want to make sure that the tools you're using are going to give you that consistent and accurate data. So after you prepare and you've got your system selected and you know what data you're going to be capturing, the next steps are to get your users on board. And this is going to be training. Um, another kind of hang up we see is getting them access to equipment. We talked to a number of people that would love to go digital, but the people doing the inspections don't have company phones or they don't have tablets to capture that data um, remotely. So making sure your team has the equipment that they're gonna need to, to work with the software program that you select. And then um, make sure you're using, uh, that they're trained up and that it's an easy to use software. Uh, you're gonna start by digitizing core compliance activities. So those are, uh, you, we recommend usually starting with like the daily, uh, weekly or monthly inspections, as well as like your lab data. And finally, have the ability to leverage that historic data so that you can pull in old lab reports through a file upload system. So after you start the data collection, um, the next thing you might want to start looking at is automating data sources. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of our new customers are starting here. They're starting with the automating data sources and then they'll bring the people in uh, later. So you can start here if you want, automate data sources. You want to identify those areas where, um, you know, who are you asking to send you data on a regular basis? What information are people sending to you? Is that production data, utility data? Are you going out um, and collecting data from um, like flow meters or uh, other sensors? And then work with your IT team and your software provider to leverage their API to get that data directly from its source into your central software solution. And then finally, so after you've got, you know, you, you know what needs to be collected, people are out there collecting the data, um, maybe you got some data just flowing right into your um, software, then you're going to look at creating those dashboards, uh, reports, and visualizations that you need to share um, with leadership or that you're sending out to regulators. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you get your alerts uh, set up. So again, like Ryan mentioned that communicate, make sure people know when they're supposed to collect the data, um, as well as alerts around limits. And then finally, you wanna spend some time in that software and digging in and finding out what data is available to you. Is it in a format that's intuitive to you? And then you're gonna um, assess what's going on, um, iterate, and uh, make changes if you need to. So uh, software, it's not usually a one and done process. There's always the opportunity to iterate and a great vendor is gonna partner with you and iterate alongside you. So picking software, what not to do. Um, don't just go out and get an email notification system. Your staff is gonna hate it. In a similar 
vein, you don't want just a, a check the box system where they're still doing their inspection on paper and then maybe they're scanning it and, and uploading it and just checking off a box. That's not gonna give you the access to that qualitative data that you're gonna need. Um, again, don't ignore the time and cost to set it up. And finally, you wanna get leadership involved early and get them excited. This is a big change. And if you're championing this change, it can have huge impacts to your career. We, uh, at our summit last year, we heard from multiple people who received promotions after implementing this kind of change at their organization. Questions to ask vendors. Um, again, start off, what percentage of customers are doing more than just task tracking? There's a lot of softwares out there. A lot of them do a lot of things but making sure that people are actually using the software for all of its intended purpose. Um, ask them about how to handle your air and water data. Can you run calculations on it? Can you set custom limits by site? Can you set notify? Can you set multiple, like a trigger alert and a limit alert? Uh, finally, ask them, how does the setup happen? Do you have to do it yourself? Do you have to hire a consultant? to do it or are they doing the build out um, or is the vendor doing the build out for you? Um, and then how long does it take for a company of our size to get up and running? So ask them, you know, who, who have you recently onboarded that's similar to us and how did that take? And then finally, hear from them directly, hear from your vendor directly, what challenges um, will you face in implementing? Because your success manager is gonna have been there and done this before and helped somebody else bring about this change. And they're gonna be very knowledgeable in helping you bring this change to your company. So, um, so that's how you get up and running. And now you're probably gonna need to convince um, management. So we're, Ryan's gonna talk to you about bringing the business case um, for change to your company. Yeah, so a big part of any system, whether you're implementing mapistry or just advocating for budget and time and resources for, for anything, um, is around what's the business case? Because you're gonna get asked, what's the ROI? You're gonna ask other people, what's the ROI in this? Like, why go through this process of change? It's always easier just to stay with, you know, status quo, everyone knows it, we're, we're, we're doing okay. Or we've never gotten fined before, or it's not so bad, we don't really need to change. Like change is hard. So you gotta build the business case of like, why are we gonna change the way we're operating? For some, it's just, it's 2022, we've been doing it this way for 40 years, like we shouldn't be doing everything on paper in Excel. Like there, there is a, like a, a mandate within the company of just like digital transformation, let's go do that. But what does that what does that mean? And for really anybody, whether your company has already said we're going to transform, digitize everything, uh, you'll still be arguing for budget and like why now and what do you want to do. So it's helpful to get, to have context on it. So we look at it as four ways that you could make the the business case or the business goal. It could be for revenue revenue reasons. It could be for operational reasons. It could be for growth company growth. Um, it could be for your customers probably the business case is gonna be a bunch of those business goals, um, but it could be just one of those four, it could be all of them blended together. And we're gonna walk through, you know, what is it you're trying, what's the goal of these four? We're gonna talk about what are the benefits, the specific benefits for each, for each of those reasons? And then what are the metrics, of, you know, how do, we, how do we measure success at the end of the day? And a big thing our customer experience team thinks about is, and our accounts team here that Courtney and I think about is like, where do you want to go with this? Like, what does success look like to you? And if we start that conversation really early before you become a Mapistry customer, we can ensure that you actually hit it. And as Courtney said, it can be promotions, it can be bonuses, it can be company transformation, it can be more business, like revenue, because you've met certain sustainability metrics. Like, we want to know about that up front because if we don't know, we can't really help guide you down this. And we've done this enough with other companies that we can say, what about this? Or mm, I think this might, you know, we can help kind of coach you through that process, just taking all the ways all different companies and industries are approaching this. So this business case conversation, we'll start with is the revenue side. You know, what is, how do we increase profits? How do we decrease costs? Um, oftentimes for the business goals, you know, with, with data that could be around, 
improving operations, like just the efficiency, so it reduce costs, like less people, less time. It could be reduced risk, less, less violations. You know, it's going to be a, a, a bottom line approach on the revenue side. And then some of the ways we can look at that is sales growth. It could be shareholder value. It could just be company value of having a really great system that's very resilient to workforce changes, um, to regulatory changes. You're able to operate because you've got this flexibility into the system. What does that mean in practice? If you've got a really great system uh, around your EHS data is when you lose a plant manager, the EHS manager isn't having to spend two weeks trying to scramble to find documents uh, and train them up. You can drop them in and say, okay, here's your to-do list. It's gonna show up on your phone every morning. This is all the stuff that you as a plant manager need to do to comply with all our environmental and safety requirements. Um, that is a very flexible, resilient system in place, um, which means that that plant manager whose primary responsibility is not environmental is on like batching concrete or turning big rocks into small rocks and running like aggregate operations. All these things happen and that drives the, the top line revenue growth and cuts down the costs of getting them up to speed. So those are some of the things to think about from a revenue business case. Number two, somewhat related is the operations business case. How do we just make things more efficient? Like, and we hear this time and time again, and you know, Courtney and I talk about it, you know, when we talk to customers of like frontline personnel, operations production, when they go, oh, so easy, I, I had this inspection, I just could pull out my phone and just, it told me what to do and I just went through and I didn't even have to go back to my office. I didn't have to take my piece of paper, go back to the office, scan it in, save it on the file, shared files, email the environmental manager, find that corrective action, tell somebody, like, I just walked around and I, they told me what to answer and it just, it was magic. Um, that's the best case. That's like really efficient operationally because you've, you've automated a lot of those manual tasks. You've decreased, decreased the like, do the form, scan the form, send the form, like all of that stuff is just gone. So you get tasks done on time, you get the core compliance done on time, um, that onboarding time comes in, which is ultimately a revenue impact. You can see how these kind of business goals and business cases mesh up. Um, and you get stuff done on, on time, you know, especially as you're talking operations production, 50 things to do, environmental, probably number 51. Um, but if you can make it really easy, it gets up the list a little bit and it just happens a lot faster. So revenue case often tied to operations. Operations is what's driving top line revenue growth. This is where you can have a top line impact on the organization. If you get somebody on the operations or production or field side up to speed faster, you're having a top line impact and that's where it just is not a cost center. It's, it's a, it can drive revenue. Um, the other one is just business growth. We can look at it um, in just pure business growth case. You know, how do you be a better strategic business partner to your organization so when the business scales you can quickly like have all the environmental safety stuff set up um, if you're on if your company's doing a lot of acquisitions mergers uh, you can respond much better um, and you can just recruit you know you can retain employees you can get them more engaged you can look like from a, uh, a measurable standpoint um, you can hit like company uh, like key objectives on digital transformation. You want to say, you know, we, we digitize this process. We uh, engage with employees this many times on sustainability measures, or we help recruit, or we reduce the headcount need for an EHS department. Those are all like growth factors that you can measure. And then the fourth and final piece is customers. And this is really like, this is how you impact that top line revenue growth how do you increase your reach? How do you strengthen loyalty with customers? And how does that tie to the, to the purchase of a digital platform? Well, one is you can just do sustainability reporting, which is, as everyone has seen, um, you know, has grown in significance. And just from a customer pressure um, and a shareholder and stakeholder for the public companies. Uh, and just maintaining compliance is like, you know, a lot of times, for insurance purposes, you have to report out on this. Um, you know, one example is like you get your third party pollution liability insurance. You have to, one, know where all your underground or above ground storage, fuel storage tanks are. The number of people that have come onto Mapistry and as part of the onboarding realize that they have a lot more tanks than they 
you know, had disclosed to their insurance company, like having it in one place, all of a sudden means you actually have third party pollution liability coverage for these that you're paying this insurance for. Or the flip side is, how do I reduce my insurance um, because I've got a system in place? The other thing is, from a customer standpoint, is you know, you can tout it in the marketplace. We see people do that more and more. Um, you'll see a lot on companies' websites, sustainability measures, the program. Um, sometimes it's in RFP questionnaires, but you can just measure of like, and this is the fuzzier part is like brand awareness, customer retention. Sometimes it's just winning contracts that have a sustainability or a compliance component to it. So there's kind of four business cases that we look at. Um, you're probably a blend of them, but I've, one of the polls I had for the audience is, you know, if you were to pick one, what would you use? And I'll share the results with everybody. Because I think it's interesting is like, what would you pick if you were to advocate for any kind of digital system in EHS? What would be your number one reason to implement it? Give people another 10, 15 seconds to answer this. All right. I'm gonna share the results. So, you know, a lot of people are saying operations, like operational efficiencies, better business partner. Um, my challenge to all of you would to be to think about how do you how do you make a business case in the other areas? What would you need to say to somebody within the company that you can grow revenue through the EHS program and like EHS data? This is more of a challenge um, because it's harder. It's harder to make those cases. It, the numbers tend to be a little bit fuzzier um, than operational efficiencies um, or responding to like workforce shortages or just keeping core compliance. But that would be my takeaway is. Think about can you make, because that's where I want to see EHS go, that's our vision, is can we be a top line revenue generator, not just cut costs? Um, and how do we make EHS a source of pride for the company, for the customers, for the employees? So that's the challenge um, for all of you. So I'm going to hide and then Courtney, if you can flip up our, we've got a couple minutes left to take questions. Um, and then Courtney's and I's email is here, but if you have any questions, feel free to submit it through the question panel um, and we can answer them. And then the final piece is if, and if you want to just shoot us an email, some of the stuff's more nuanced and we'll send out like slides and the ebook. Um, the other thing to mention is, you know, obviously we, we do this day in, day out from a platform perspective. We're happy to share learnings from other people that have implemented, whether it be Mapistry or other systems. Um, but our goal really is to solve this problem, is to get all the data in environmental out there into one place, whether it be inspections, whether it be lab data, whether it be air data, run those calcs. That digital solution is what Mapistry does, and that's our vision in constantly improving that process. Because at the end of the day, we wanna be able to drive that top line revenue and cut costs and really like protect the environment, reduce the risk of non-compliance and lawsuits and fines. So if you wanna stick around for a couple more minutes, Courtney's gonna give a quick demo um, of our platform and obviously reach out to us if you want to, to, to learn more about our history. Great. Um, yeah, for those of you sticking around, I'm gonna open up over here. This is uh, the Map History dashboard and it's set up at the site level, so each facility is set up to track the information that is specific to their operation. So no two dashboards are really going to have to be the same because each one's going to set up for the information they're going to collect. And I just wanted to demo uh, one of my favorite tools here, which is our lab uploader tool. So down here in water sample results, what I can do is when a lab sends me back that EDD file, that um, Excel file with my lab reports in it, I can come in here and hit upload lab report. And then I'm going to pull that um, and grab that from where it's saved on my computer. 
And what it's doing now is it's reading in the SAB report. And what I love about this tool is we know every lab is sending back, you know, their own format of the EDD. And so it's gonna start by matching those lab headers to the Mapistry data field. So you're not needing to take your Excel and like copy paste and rearrange the Excel so that you can get the data um, into your system. It's gonna just do this smart matching where it's checking the sample ID. Um, it's gonna recognize the parameter names. It knows, you know, results are parameter values. And it's gonna match it again to all of those Mapistry database fields. It gives me a chance to review it. I'm gonna be able to see my data real quickly. If anything was wrong, like say I'd already uploaded the April 13th data, this would be red and let me know it's wrong. So it's gonna check, let me know everything's okay. Um, continue, uh, yes, I'll submit it. And then it's that easy for me to get my lab report into a central system uh, where I can use that data and I can get information from that data over here on my Mapistry dashboard. It's going to chart um, over time my different sample results. It'll let me know if there was any exceedances found, um, any flagged results from the laboratory. And you know it's all here for me to interact with and I can export this data um, back out of Mapistry. So this is going to pull up um, a table of those sample results and let me download that data. And that's kind of our, our vision is how do we get the data in as easily as possible? Like Courtney doesn't have to do any manual data entry and then all of a sudden it's in visualizations and we can start asking questions of like, how have I been doing across multiple locations? Uh, what's the mass loading? Like, can I take my TSS and my flow rates and look at the mass loading of different things and, and start answering business questions and environmental compliance questions with that data? So I know that was a very small snapshot of <laughs> the, the two minute demo of, of how we can pull data in and make it easier. And for a lot of the folks, you know, I think 69% of you said, you know, operation business case, this is a great example of like, we're gonna get Mapistry because it takes me half an hour to get lab reports, manually enter them. We have to do X amount of lab reports. I'm gonna cut half an hour time. Like that's the operation business case right there and as you saw in 60 seconds we can just like eliminate a bunch of time to getting lab data in and being able to visualize it um i appreciate everyone sticking around if you have questions on mapistry want to see a deeper dive demo we can talk about integrations um the file upload but also just like mobile app and we didn't even talk about really mapping components to this where we're talking a whole platform of data so feel free to reach out to either of us but we appreciate everybody for sticking around today